Welcome to another edition of The Rabbi Speaks. I'm Rabbi Abba Perlmutter, your host, where for every week for half an hour we discuss issues of the day, primarily from uh, our own unique perspective. Last week, the world lost a very special person. I'm talking about the passing of Mr. Simon Wiesenthal, the famous Nazi hunter who died at the age of 96. Now, some of you may not be familiar with Mr. Wiesenthal. After the World War II, he dedicated himself into tracking down those people that were responsible for the Holocaust. And as of last week, just before his passing, he was credited with bringing to justice 1,100 Nazi war criminals, including probably the most famous of all Nazi war criminals, Adolf Eichmann, who was captured in the early 1960s in Argentina and brought to trial in Israel where he was ultimately executed for crimes against humanity. Mr. Wiesenthal was really a unique and a rare individual. Before the war, he was an architect. And uh, when the Nazis set out to destroy the Jewish people, and that's why we have the name Holocaust, for those who are unfamiliar, the Nazis during 1939 to 1945 set out a campaign under Adolf Hitler to literally exterminate the Jewish people from this world. They ultimately succeeded in killing six million, which was one third of the Jewish population in the world at that time and two thirds of the population of European Jewry at that time. Mr. Wiesenthal was caught up in this, in the Holocaust, and was transferred from one concentration camp to another concentration camp. The concentration camps, of course, were set up by the Nazis initially to have political prisoners housed there, but ultimately they were turned over into death camps where Jews from throughout Europe and Asia were brought and systematically exterminated there. And Mr. Wiesenthal was one of the lucky few that actually survived the death camps. And after the war, he dedicated himself, his life, and everything that he had to tracking down these war criminals. Some of the Nazis were actually caught very shortly after World War II. And we tried them as an American war tribunal in Nuremberg, the Nuremberg War Trials, and several of them were executed. But thousands upon thousands upon thousands scattered all over the world and escaped the long arm of justice. But Wiesenthal was not content to going back to his previous life as an architect. No, this was not for him. Wiesenthal decided that he was now going to take upon himself this duty to see that these people never have a good night's sleep. And as I mentioned before, over 1,000 Nazi war criminals were brought to justice because of Simon Wiesenthal. Up in Los Angeles, there's a Simon Wiesenthal Center and attached to the Museum of tolerance. For those that haven't paid a visit to there yet, I strongly suggest you go there and you even take your children. Because as Simon Wiesenthal started out on a mission of revenge, it turned into a mission of justice. For it was not only a crime against the Jewish people which the Nazis had perpetrated, but it was really a crime against humanity. Decent, honest people that had nothing to do with the war were savagely beaten and ultimately killed in these death camps. And the perpetrators, the butchers, the criminals that these, did these acts were the ones that Wiesenthal was after. Unfortunately, we still have today genocide throughout the world. And we have political leaders and tyrants that are still perpetrating this war against their own people, this war against humanity. And if Wiesenthal taught us anything, it is that these people should not be allowed to escape justice. We must do everything we can to bring these people to, the, to trial and to convict them and to sentence them for the crimes that they perpetrated against their own people. I don't really want to talk to you today about Wiesenthal's accomplishments because they speak for themselves. You can go to any encyclopedia, you could look it up online, Google him, and you will see what Simon Wiesenthal did for this world. I want to talk today about a very special challenge that Simon Wiesenthal presents to every single one of us. The people that survived the Holocaust, and again I must reiterate for those that are unfamiliar with this, that the Nazis tried, as Hitler had written in his book Mein Kampf, 
that the Jews were the problem of all of the ills of society. That if only we can get rid of the Jews, the world would be a much better place. This, was, this had changed from religious anti-Semitism to racial anti-Semitism. There was nowhere for a Jew to hide. And Hitler and his henchmen under the SS gathered up these Jews and slowly but surely systematically ex tried to exterminate them. It was only un because of the end of the war and that the Americans had liberated together with the British the death camps such as Auschwitz, Mattenhausen, Treblinka, Medanik and all of the other places that the few survivors that were came home and started to rebuild their families. These people had very different reactions to the Holocaust in which they had suffered. Some people, such as my very own uncle, became an extremely devout person. He didn't want to really examine the Holocaust from a theological position for where was God, why didn't God save us, how can you still be religious, seeing what went on there, literally going to hell and coming back is something that is not easy for a human being to take. So my uncle decided early on that he was not going to question, he was just going to be a very faithful person and raise his children in that faith. And there was no discussion of where God was. It was simply a fact that God did what God did and we must continue to live our lives, our lives as, as dedicated and observant Jews. No ands, if, or buts. That was it. On the other end of the scale, I want to tell you about a special person that lived in Maplewood, New Jersey. As a young rabbinical student studying at Rabbinical College of America in Morristown, every Friday we did some outreach work. We went to visit Jewish people throughout New Jersey to discuss with them the beauty of the Torah and of Judaism. And we ran into this fellow, a tailor, that lived in Maplewood, New Jersey. And he was a Holocaust survivor, again, one of those that survived the Nazi death camps. And we had asked him if he would like to participate in a very special precept, a very special mitzvah that we have, and that was donning the tefillin, putting on the phylacteries that Jews do in the morning prayer. It's a great mitzvah, it's wonderful, and we were on this campaign to get more and more people involved in this mitzvah, this commandment. He absolutely refused, and he explained to us, me and my friend, my colleague, who was also a rabbinical student, that he had lived through the Holocaust and he could not see how after one and a half million innocent children were put to death for no other reason that they were, because they were Jews, he could not put on film anymore and say to God that I love you. He just didn't have it within his heart to do that. And week after week and week after week as we came there for two years, this tailor refused to put on film. So here you see the dichotomy of reaction of two different people that lived through the very same thing. My uncle who lost his parents, a sister, 81st cousins, didn't want to think about it and didn't want to debate it. He stayed faithful and always remained observant till today. The tailor in Maplewood had given up his faith, had lost all belief in God and couldn't see it. Simon Wiesenthal took another path. He was not the one that was going to debate the theological issues. To him it was not an issue where God was, that was not the question. Nor was it the question of abandoning Judaism altogether. Simon Wiesenthal took upon himself to do something for the memory of the six million people. And although that it started as a revenge campaign, that he wanted to see those very people that built those gas chambers, the very people that ordered thousands and thousands and thousands of people packed together in cattle cars, where he wanted to see them brought to justice, yes, because he was hurting, he wanted revenge, he needed to do something. As the years went by, it became a campaign of justice to show the world the truth that mass murderers cannot just simply walk away and live peacefully. It was not easy for him because he didn't get much help from foreign governments and it certainly it wasn't easy to raise money for this cause but yet he wouldn't stop. Here was Simon Wiesenthal, a regular man, an architect before the war, not born into great aristocracy, not a great scholar, not a great political leader, a very ordinary person that transformed himself to become exceptional. A regular guy who turned into a hero. 
And here, my friends, lays the challenge for each and every one of us. Can we, as regular ordinary folk, not specially great scholars, not specially holy people, become holy, become special, and become exceptional? Every day, if you think about it, we have the opportunity of doing special things for other people. We do. You wake up in the morning, you get dressed, you're always encountering different opportunities. But what happens? We basically miss most of the opportunities. We're either not conscious enough or we just don't want to. We pass that beggar on the street, that homeless guy, day after day, day after day. And yet we still refuse to do it because we give ourselves all different kinds of excuses. That elderly person that you wanted to visit in the nursing home, day after day passes and you still haven't visited them. Your friend, so many opportunities, and it goes by without us lifting a finger. Simon Wiesenthal looks at us. Simon Wiesenthal looks directly into our eyes, and he says, my friends, I did it. Now it's your turn. People like Wiesenthal make us uncomfortable. Why do they make us uncomfortable? Because we're not ready for the challenge. We like to sit comfortably in our homes and do our own things. We don't want to feel guilty. We don't want to be that person that rises up. We want to be the person that sits in the back of the classroom and begs for the teacher not to call upon them. Sure, there are individuals that want to be called upon. There are individuals that want to be the ones that rise up. But for, mo for the most of us, for most of you out there in the viewing audience, you would rather sit back and take it easy and just blend into the crowd, never being the one that wears purple when everybody else is wearing white. You don't want to be that person. And Wiesenthal and people like Wiesenthal look at us and they say to us, no, my friend, you cannot sit by. If you count yourself as a, as a member of our society, if you want to count yourself as a member of the human race, and you want to elevate this place to be the best possible place that it can be, you just cannot b sit back. You don't have to be born into a special family. You don't have to have any special gifts. You don't got to be a great speaker, a great orator. No, you have to be a regular person who wants to break out of that shell. And that's why people like Simon Wiesenthal and others like him, because in every generation you have several people like Simon Wiesenthal, challenge us, look at us, throw us the flame. They said, we've done it. I was no one special, but when the opportunity came, I didn't turn my back. I went ahead and I tried my best to do what I can do for this world. What about us? What about us? What would we do? when it really matters. Can we count on you? Are you going to be ready for the challenge when need arises? My friends, recently we've seen the devastation in the United States like we've never seen before. Hurricane Katrina hit the, hit the Gulf Coast with such a ferocity that it literally wiped out and engulfed the whole city of, of New Orleans, covered it with water. And many, many thousands and hundreds of thousands of people had to flee. The media and the press played up the idea of the lawlessness that was rampaging through New Orleans at that time. They reported all the rapes, the murders, the shootings, the people that were standing on the roof and actually shooting at the people that were trying to rescue them. We got a lot of that kind of reporting. Tons and tons. New Orleans is like the Wild West. Well, the, the National Guard, when they first came there, were given instruction that they were not, they, I repeat, they were not to rescue people, but they were supposed to bring lawfulness back to New Orleans. The people that were living in the, uh, in, 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 in the Superdome and in the convention center it was, 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 was a free-for-all. And night after night and article after article just kept pounding and reporting and compounding and reporting that. Whether these things happened or they were exaggerated, that is for history to tell us. I don't know, and it, for this show today, it doesn't really matter. What really matters today is at the same time that the media and the press were reporting all of these acts that we and the, the rest of the country were calling disgusting, unbelievable, it's terrible, how can people live like this? 
this very same time, there were hundreds and hundreds of acts of heroism. People that risked their lives, that went back into the eye of the storm, went back to the flooded areas of Louisiana and the other parishes in Louisiana of New Orleans and the other parishes of Louisiana and rescued literally hundreds of people. Did, we, did, we, did they get reported? Were they the ones that were on the forefront of the news? No. Why? Because sometimes we live in a cynical age. If it l bleeds, it leads. Right? That's what makes the news. But what about the heroism of that individual person? That guy that waded into the water and rescued those two old people that were stuck in a car that was surrounded by, by alligators. I don't know. And hundreds and hundreds of these stories that regular, ordinary folk, not people that were trained to do this, but people that just felt a compassion and felt compelled to go out of their way to rescue another human being. Unfortunately, we don't have enough of those stories in the media. We should have taken these people and we should have elevated them. The president should have automatically taken five heroes and presented them on the news and said, my fellow Americans, this is what America is all about. Not the lawlessness that was portrayed in New Orleans, but this is what Americans do. In time of need, we sacrifice the people, the children that raised money all around the country that gave from their little cookie drives and their bake sales and all of these things to send money to people they don't know and will never meet in their lives. Those are the heroes that we should be emulating here in this country. Not always focusing on the negative. Of course, we all know that if you're all, a good story never gets told. But for our intents and purposes, ladies and gentlemen, for us to be able to live a life of specialness and of holiness, we need to hear those stories. We need to see those people that went out of their way. The modern day Simon Wiesenthal's, yes, it was not for a lifetime. They didn't dedicate themselves to the survivors of Katrina and forever going to help them. No, it could have been for an hour. It could have been for a day. It could have been for a week. It could have been for a month. It doesn't make a difference. Acts of heroism are the things that make us non-barbarians, that keep civilization going. My own colleague, who ran a synagogue in New Orleans, his family living here in Long Beach, frantically looking for him. It was two days they were calling and they were trying to locate, where is he, this rabbi? And when they finally located him, he told them that he could not leave the city unless he was sure that his congregation was safe and sound. That there were visitors in New Orleans that were kicked out of hotels, had nowhere to turn to, nowhere to go. No car, no phone, nothing. And this rabbi, Rabbi Nemes, took them into his home. And once he saw that everybody was safe and sound, then he turned and worried about his own safety. Ladies and gentlemen, think about that for a moment. Think about what it takes to make a difference in this world. That's why people like Simon Wiesenthal come about in an age of total barbarism. When we talk about Adolf Hitler, the butcher, the ultimate evil in, in, in history, pure evil, a man that didn't have a good bone in his body, that set up for the destruction of innocent people. To counter that, we need people like Simon Wiesenthal. And today, as I speak to, to you, as I sit here today and speak to you, we have in the world also calamities and tragedies and people that need help. People that are reaching out and looking at us. Can we make that difference? Can we rise up and walk out of the living room? Shut the television for a second. Not this show, of course. But shut the television for a second. Close it. Go outside. Find out what your neighborhood needs. Does it need a cleanup? Does your library need more books? Does your public school need more desks? Find out what the community needs and get involved. Do something exceptional. When your children are going to look at you, are going to say to you, Daddy, Mommy, what is life all about? You're not going to say it's only about eating and feeding your family. It's so easy to do that. It's so easy to get lost because we live in a tremendous metropolis here in Los Angeles. There's 10, 15, 20 million people here. The chances of someone calling upon you is very, very small. But let that not be a deterrent. Allow us to learn from the life of Simon Wiesenthal, an ordinary, simple person that after the war understood that he could not go about life as it was. No. This is not for him. He cannot allow criminals to walk down the street. Do we need 
a calamity? Do we need a catastrophe to bring out from within each and every single one of us that goodness that we have, that specialness that we have, that heroism that lays, I know, in the heart of every single person. If only they're called to duty, they would do that. But why do we have to wait? Do we need to wait for another Katrina? God forbid, here in California, we have been spared a great catastrophe. And I don't want to see a great catastrophe. And I don't want to see an earthquake come to California. And I hope that it never, ever, ever happens. And I hope that that's not the type of event that's going to bring out the greatness. There are so many special people here in our city that just do things on a daily basis without any fanfare without any television following them around. Those, my friends, are the true heroes. The ones that we sometimes, the media put up as heroes or that we invent as heroes on the screen. Forget about those. Those are just people that fake, they're playing a role. They're not the true heroes. The true heroes are the exceptional people that go out there every single day and do a tremendous job. That's why Simon Wiesenthal presents a problem for us because he passes us the torch. He says to us very clearly, looking into our eyes, my friend, I did it, and I was nobody, but I became somebody because the need was there. How about you? Can you become that person? Can you elevate yourself? Can you strengthen yourself and gather all the resolve within your belly to be not the best that you can be, but to be the super best that you could be? Superman, interesting character, could fly, could this, could do it, but he gets pounded down by kryptonite. Even the greatest people, the most powerful people, the most invincible people have their moments of doubt. And even Simon Wiesenthal had, had his moments of doubt, whether he was doing the right thing. And he wrote a book called The Sunflower, which I urge you if you could get it. And you could probably find it on uh, Amazon.com or wherever. But Simon Wiesenthal, he is the one that truly forgot that he was, had any doubts. He didn't even let himself linger, give himself the opportunity and the leisure to wallow in his doubts to think whether he's doing the right thing. He needed to move forward. He needed to press forward. He needed to go forward in order for him to really achieve what he set out to do. And that, my friends, is the challenge that I present to myself and the challenge that I present to my congregation and the challenge that we present to each other to live a life of heroism, to live a life of holiness, to live a life of specialness where we don't have to look into the mirror at night and say what we could have done for society but what we did do for society. And it's especially auspicious that we find ourselves right now one week before the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a new beginning. It's the head of the year. It is a time when we Jews celebrate the end of the past year and the coming in of the new year. If you have nowhere to go for high holiday services, let me invite you to come and join us at Show by the Shore down at 6400 East Pacific Coast Highway at the Seaport Marina Hotel. If you need more information, you can always go to our website, showbytheshore.org. Everyone is invited and we don't care where you come from. There's no membership dues at all. Everybody can come in and participate in the high holiday services. But Rosh Hashanah, again, speaks to us. The new year tells us, my friend, this is a new beginning. I know that maybe last year you did things that maybe you were not so proud of. Eh, you know what? I did this, I did that. I don't want to get into all of the details. You know, well, everybody has their own little secrets that they hide. A good businessman goes and he does inventory every once in a while. What is the purpose of business? You buy things at a low cost and you want to sell them at a profit. From time to time, even the best of businessmen make a wrong purchase. They buy too many of one thing or they buy the wrong style or whatever it is. And what do they do with it? They put it in the back of their warehouse and they let it sit there. They let it, they let it rot. From time to time, if he's wise, he does what we call an inventory. He looks around his warehouse and he sees those things that he can sell those articles that he made a good buy on, he's going to keep. But the ones that he made a bad purchase on, he gets rid of. Why do they need, do they need to take up space in his warehouse? It doesn't do him any good. The same thing is true in Rosh Hashanah. 
It is symbolically a time when we can clear out our closet. We can look into ourselves and say, you know what, this past year I did a lot of great things. I did A, B, C, and D. At the same time, I might have accumulated some of the things that I'm not so proud of. I'm not going to, you know, I did A, B, C, D, E, and G. Now, those things I'm going to get rid of. Those are the things I'm going to throw out of my warehouse. I don't want to let, let, leave them lingering around because they're only holding me down. Cut the rope. Let those things sail away. Clear your conscience. Go to the synagogue. Come to services. Open up the prayer book. Look into the words and say to God, you know what, God? What, what was in the past is in the past. Whatever I did, I did. I'm not going to do anymore. I'm going to be a brand new person. God is a forgiving God. He wants us to turn back to him and ask for forgiveness, and he will forgive. It strengthens our relationship with him. It makes our bond with him even stronger. And this happens every Rosh Hashanah. But my friend, just like a good sale, it doesn't last forever. It only lasts for 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. But once Yom Kippur passes and the last of the services have ended, there's Ne'ilah. There's the closing service where the gates of repentance shut and it's much harder to get in to see God. Today we have an analogy that God is like the king in the field where he allows everybody to approach him and he has a happy face on him. But that's only for right now. That is only for the time being that now we have an opportunity to seek out God in his countenance and to tell him, dear God, let's call it even. Whatever you did to me, I forgive you. And whatever I did to you, I want you to forgive me. Because now is the time for renewal, not to look back. Let us take the life of Simon Wiesenthal and integrate it into our own lives. Let us rise up to the challenge of these saintly people, of these heroic people, and make a difference in this world. Because you know who it's going to help? Not only the victims, not only the people that accept your kindness, but it's going to make a difference in your own very life. And this will ensure that when God writes down in his big book on your page, he will grant you and your family a happy, healthy, and successful new year. And that's what I wish you. Thank you very much for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Rabbi Abba Perlmutter, and hope to see you soon at Shul by the Shore. Thanks. Shem, the Chatzoy Sem, the Kinyu, the Yafri, 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 the Yafri,